The one interview I would like a do-over is when I interviewed Bob Marley. The man responsible for it all, they say, was Bob Marley. Bob, you've been labeled a powerful political individual. How do you regard that? Well, I mean, yeah, we was like, we tried for my career to bring peace, knowing that we really can't solve the problem with a war, you know. So the sun will shine in my day We don't really want the island to change. We want the world to change. I was very young, and I had been encouraged by the producers at the time to take a tough position with him, to take him to task to a certain extent. Rastafarianism is very popular in Jamaica, yet in Canada and the United States it has a bad reputation. People are associated with drugs and the trafficking of marijuana and violence, police yeah, arrest. Man. I wouldn't say that the Rastafarians have a bad reputation. I would say people give the Rastafarians bad reputation because the Rastafarians, I mean, you know what I mean? All of these things happening before the Rastafarians even start coming to Canada anyway around here. <laughs> I think I was very naive, very young, and I certainly cringe every time I look at it now. Again, I would love the opportunity to sit down with him and ask him the questions that he's due. This icon, this extraordinary talent, should have been asked. It is an absolutely beautiful day in the nation's capital, and that is a view that's perhaps the most recognizable building in Canada, representing the seat of power in this country. When it comes to interviewing politicians... Hello, Mr. Mulroney. Nice yeah, to see hi, you again. Sandy. Nice to see you again. I want them to stop being the politician for a moment with me and reveal something about themselves. If you're not controversial, it means you haven't done anything. Uh, in my early days, uh, there, were all, there was a lot of partying after dinner and in the House of Commons. The moments when I've been able to capture or glean or learn a little bit about who they are as people, that for me is a huge win-win. I can handle conflict, uh, but I prefer to try to resolve it. Now, my defeat in 1993 was a very devastating one. I think it's a pity that in Canada we don't pay more attention to the role that our leaders have played. Would you agree? No. You were too nice, and that's why you didn't make no, it as no. prime minister? No, uh, being defeated was not a personal rebuke, as far as I was concerned. We have departments, various departments, that are not nearly as important. I was one of the last journalists to interview John Diefenbaker, and I, I met him in his tiny little office. And I think I asked one question during the entire half hour, and he just kept talking. That today there are in Canada, according to the latest statistics, and I'm referring to the 1970 census, 1,725,000 over 65. I've interviewed wives of politicians, and it was interesting to hear what they had to say about trying to normalize the lives of their children within an environment that was anything but normal. I'm so glad to have her home. Mila Mulrooney was the same way. I interviewed her at Harrington Lake. Is there something that you've desperately wanted to do all these years but haven't been able to? Oh, I'll tell you, all right, I'll tell you, I haven't even told my children this, I want to run in a marathon. No. I really do. I, if I could see my daughter over there, yeah, that's yeah. what I want to do. I had a sense, this is a mother who's fully engaged with her children, despite the fact that she lives in a political bubble with her husband. This is one of the earlier ones with Kylie when he was just 18 months old. And there's Justin, Sasha, and Michelle. And for everything that Margaret Trudeau went through, and, and it was for her such a public journey, certainly one of the more interesting moments 28 years ago is Justin showing up unexpectedly. Justin. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> yeah. What a pleasure. Nice to see you. My goodness, it's been forever. Come, it has come indeed. sit down in your office, which we have now taken over. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite all right. That year that I interviewed your mom, mm. 1995. Um, actually, when my son saw a clip of that interview a few years ago, he said, Dad, you were drinking a Coke. You tell us not to drink Coke. And there you were drinking a Coke. See, we can be able to drink Coke. I'm like, no, no. don't. 
it was, that was a bad example. And I asked you, what was the takeaway from your parents? Is there anything you've learned from the experiences that both your parents have gone through? Mm -hmm. Nothing I should talk about on camera, I think. Ah, the politician already. Mm. <laughs> no. Never, never. 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 I'm going to be a teacher. Never? Never I'll be a teacher. Uh, that was certainly where I was then. I was still just a kid just trying to figure things out. But one of the things I did know was how important it was to make a difference in the world. And I had just realized that I wanted to be a teacher. But your answer was so quick. Was it because you had a negative view of politics at the time? No, it's because from the time I was five years old, everyone asked me if I wanted to be prime minister one day. And I learned to answer no, automatically, instantly. Uh, the longer answer of, I don't know where my life's going to take me, and I'm going to look to make a difference, and we'll see what happens, is somewhat less satisfactory than just being able to say no right now, which, as anyone knows in politics, it's always a no, 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 until it's finally a yes and you do it. Uh, when I saw that clip again, I was thinking about how I'm now raising my own kids uh, in a, a very similar but very different situation. If one of them came to you, you wouldn't discourage them from going into politics if they said, I, that's what I want to do with my life. I would, I would spend all my time talking about why. The, what are the reasons why this is the path that's right for you? So you don't come at it and say, well, I want to be a politician as an end result. It's what is the thinking and the, and the things you want to do that means that going into politics is the best way of articulating that or achieving that. So no regrets, 28 years after that interview, nothing that you would take back. I probably would have worn a proper shirt for that interview if I knew I was going to be prime minister. <laughs>on the University of Ottawa campus at the Alex Trebek Alumni Hall, you Ottawa's most famous graduate and most generous benefactor. You know, when someone has been on television for a long time, and I speak from experience, it's easy to think that you know that person, but really, human beings are more complicated and nuanced than what the TV screen allows. Oprah gave me a good piece of advice. She said, be who you are and make them bend television around you. Don't you go out and bend yourself around television. I've interviewed a number of television personalities of the decade, some with an inflated few of themselves, huge egos. I've never met a successful person who didn't have an ego. I didn't really start out wanting to be a celebrity. It just sort of happened. And then you have Alex Trebek, host of Jeopardy, philanthropist, a huge success, yet quietly humble. I have an old motto, it's just as easy to be nice as it is to be nasty, and the rewards are far greater. And now, here is the host of Jeopardy, Alex Trebek. And welcome once again to Jeopardy. What I remember most about my interview with Alex Trebek is the fact he let us come into his home. That's his personal space. Come in. Bring the kids out again. We're come on, guys. He was so comfortable and so relaxed and proud that he was able to share insight into who he is as a person. I'm a lot looser, I think, than most people think I am. Uh, I don't take too many things seriously. Uh, what, sweetheart? Dad, I know sand in my shoes. You didn't get any sand in your shoes today? You did? It was obvious that he was a hands-on dad and was engaged with his kids. Swing to Dada. I was a very rare species in that particular world at that particular time. Right now, skating to me is the bar of the world. There isn't anybody out there that is really like changing the sport. George, where do you find the strength? I think outwardly I appear strong, and I guess I am to some degree, but I know how I hurt privately. I don't think I'm so strong privately. I get depressed, I get, I get sad, I cry every day. We grew up in a blue-collar family. We didn't grow up with a lot of money. 
And I understand that money is hard to come by, and I guess you get this sense of, okay, you have it, you don't want to just blow it and throw it away. Any regrets about investing in the Argos? No, not at all, because I knew when I invested in it that I was going to lose money. <laughs> so it was a very silly investment, to be honest. The greatest, the great one, number 99, Wayne, nice game. Full respect to those incredible athletes. They were certainly a lot of fun to talk to. But one of the greatest athletic accomplishments ever was for a cause far more important than a competition. Rick Hansen's Man in Motion Tour. And the last time I was here at the Museum of History in Gatineau, Rick had just donated more artifacts from that historic tour. The hands touched the wheel of my chair almost 15 million times through two years, two months, and two days to wheel 40,000 kilometers. What's the symbolism of those gloves for you? You know, those gloves, they represent the dreams come true, but only with uh, incredible hard work and determination. So I'm headed back to the West Coast where Rick and I have plans to catch up. After the break. This is my 50th anniversary, but it's also 50 years for you since that yes, accident that changed your yeah. life. 50 years, wow. We started the hour talking about my most difficult interview. We end it with my most favorite. When W5 continues. As you look back on the things that you've accomplished over the years, is there anything you would change? Time, I, you know, time is all there is, that all we have on this earth, and I have wasted time by continuing to do what I already knew how to do instead of doing what was scary. Well, I definitely am not in the business to get scared. I'm in the business to try and do something that hasn't ever been done before. This has to be an emotional experience for you. Yeah, there's no question. Flying in space becomes such an intimate part of you. Being indigenous is to never forget who you are and where you come from. Was that a lot to carry? I mean, it's my job or my role to contribute to public service. This is my 50th anniversary of starting at CTV, but it's also 50 years for you since that yes, accident what a that coincidence. changed your yeah, life I mean, in June of 1973. 50 years, wow. It's gone by in a heartbeat. And I, I look back and I go, that moment you know, was the most challenging and yet the best thing that ever happened to me. Why would you say that? And, uh, you know, I yeah, just would never trade it ever for anything, that's not so, even my legs. That's so interesting. And uh, things can happen to you that you can't control, your history, uh, trauma, accident, disease, heartbreak, all these things. But at some point, you, you have to realize you still have a choice. You know, how do you view that circumstance? And then where where is the love, the beauty, and the hope still in your journey? And I just have to say, uh, I'm, I'm super inspired by your journey because 50 years of coming into an organization where you, you, you think, wow, this is a, a cool idea, but you probably had no idea where it would take you, eh? Canada AM, the national, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's an incredible accomplishment. And so here's to 50. Thank you uh, on behalf of all Canadians for uh, being such an amazing person and telling our stories and helping us grow up together. Thank you. Cheers. We are in beautiful Nanaimo, British Columbia, about to meet up with a true Canadian hero. Well done, well done. I wasn't able to do this a month ago or even two weeks ago, so this is fantastic. He's given you hope that you will one day be able to walk. Yes. Trevor Green, he survived an axe attack when he was a soldier in Afghanistan in 2006. All these years later, we wanted to see how he's doing. Trevor, you know, it's nice to catch up with you again. Uh, Lovely. You're one of those people who inspired me 
because the odds were against you. Mm -hmm. Everyone thought at the time of the axe attack, 17 years ago, that you wouldn't make it. You know, your friends thought you were dead. Well, I think about how the right people were in the right place at the right time to save my life. You had a lot of good people on your side. Oh, yeah. yeah. You oh, also yeah. had Deb, and oh, yeah. Deb was told to walk away. Yeah, and stick me in a home. And at one point, you also told her to go. Yeah, I did. She didn't. No. So all these years later, how are you doing? Excellent. Yeah. Do you feel you're back to you? No. But I've reconciled myself that the old me died on that battlefield. And I'm a new person. And I'm, I like myself. A man of strength, mm. right? Strength yes. and determination. Yep. What would you say it was that's helped you get to where you are today? Debbie. Debbie. And my kids. So wonderful to see, surrounded by a family that loves you. What do you want to say to your wife? I can't believe you stayed. And I'm so grateful. Such a close, tight-knit family. It's the love that I see that touched me in so many ways. This is Second City in Toronto, and like me, it's also celebrating a golden anniversary. Since 1973, this improv and comedy hub has launched the careers of Canada's funniest people, and I've certainly interviewed a number of them over my 50 years at CTV. What I said to myself when I started out was, wouldn't it be great to get a check every week? I think the misconception people have when they talk to comedians is that they're on all the time, and they really aren't. And I switched to social work. And then, but that was kind of fantastic, because now it freed me up to do what I really want to do, is all the theater. They reflect on things and really consider what they're saying before they open their mouths. You're a hometown boy. Mm. What is it? Is it family that draws you here? What draws you back here? You can go to a lot of places around the world, and I don't think you're going to find a country that tries as hard as Canada to get it right. And I'm very proud of that. Especially now, we seem mm -hmm. to be, uh, the perception worldwide is this is a country that has its act together. Yeah, I feel like we're kind of in a weird way holding the flame for the other countries later on to kind of go, oh, I like what Canada's doing. Of course, there is one comedy legend born right here in Toronto who never performed on this stage, but he was definitely inspired by it. Lauren, how'd you get in here? I have a master key. Oh, Meet geez. the mastermind behind Saturday Night Live, Lauren Michaels. Lauren Michaels was a challenge in the sense that we couldn't get close to him. You don't like to talk about yourself, do you? Not much, no. He hated interviews, so I was thrilled that he actually said yes to me, but it was the gatekeeper every step of the way who carefully kept us at a distance. This is where we leave. Okay. Oh, good luck. All right, thank you, Lauren. It's gonna go up. Thank you. And fun fact about Lauren Michaels, his hero was also his former father-in-law, Frank Schuster, part of the legendary comedy duo Wayne and Schuster. We brought a few laughs to the people and they liked us. Lupa Goy, it was like meeting a twin sister. <laughs> That's why I was wondering if I should go, good evening, the way you do, or the way I do it. Well, because the way you do it is not the way I do it. Well, <laughs> what do you mean? Of course it is. <laughs> it gets the laughs. Yeah, yeah. CTV News with the two Sandy Ronaldos. Good evening. I'm Sandy Ronaldo. And I'm Sandy Ronaldo. <laughs> She did such a characterization of me that I felt I had to be more like Luba Goy doing me than me doing me. There were times afterwards I actually laughingly told Luba that I hear her in my head when I say goodnight. Good night. 
Comedy makes audiences feel good, but great comedians not only make you laugh out loud, <laughs> they can also change your perspective. Comedy timing is very, very like timing in sport. It's just a thing from the muscle. And if you have that sense of rhythm, of comic timing, then it's not hard to change that into physical movement. My walk has become rather sillier recently, and so it takes me rather long. We started the hour talking about my most difficult interview. We end it with my most favorite. I'm a mog, half man, half dog. What kind of stationary bike has a brake? <laughs> hey, how you doing? Who are you? I'm your Uncle Buck. How the hell are you? Well, I'm still a million bucks shy of being a millionaire. <laughs> I'll tell you another thing, the beer sucks. They get over it. Kids are resilient like that. Maybe we shouldn't talk about this. Well, you brought it up. We are at the Aero Theater in Santa Monica, a place that John Candy used to love to come to to watch movies. His children love to come here with him as well. In fact, they suggested this would be the best place for us to do our interview. Thank okay. you. Come on in. Here Big it is. Big black box. Yeah. That's yeah, beautiful. I know that we are in a place that was important to your dad. It was a quiet place and it was definitely a, a zone, yeah, that he could kind of go and it wouldn't be populated with a ton of people and, and he could just get away and watch a movie. Gosh, I think it was in 89, he took me to see a double feature here. It was Parenthood with Steve Martin, Rick Moranis, and he was super excited to sort of support his friends and it was a packed house. And the moment that the, um, vibrator scene came out, okay. uh, my dad grabbed me by my arm and took me out of oh the theater and was <laughs> cursing on the way out going, how come they never told me about this movie? This is not meant for kids. Because I didn't know what the heck, you know, as a nine-year-old not knowing what that was until uh, <laughs> many years. And then I go, oh, that's why he yeah. pulled me out of the theater. <laughs> so that explains it. Such a family man, Yes, right? very, very Such family oriented. When I interviewed him in 1993, so humble, yeah. so lovely. Yeah, that, that follows him everywhere, and there's so many stories of that for him. You know, I was in like a Uber once, and someone had been talking to me about working as a background actor, yeah. and he had gone on to talk and talk and talk, and he said, I worked a couple days on Uncle Buck, and John Candy was just the best guy to work with. He had no idea I was related to him or anything, and he just had nothing but kind words to say about him. And, those are the moments that are the best for me because they're just so human and, and the synchronicity of it is just so beautiful. And that was my sense of it. We were on the set of Hostage for a day. Right. So it, it was his directorial debut, yep, right? Yep. So he said to me, do you want to be in it? And pulled out a big megaphone. Action, Sandy. <laughs> I am acting, this is it. <laughs> He's doing it again. And I have such wonderful memories of your dad. Such wonderful, yeah. and I suppose you hear that a lot from yeah. people, right? Well, and I, yeah, we do. We hear it from you, and just like that from that interview, and uh, he was super excited to direct, and he put so much effort, into effort that, yeah. and heart and energy into that. He talked about how October is a difficult month for him because he lost his dad when mm -hmm. he was five years old. Right. I took on a responsibility of going to work, you know, that that was the thing to do probably taking on the father role unconsciously, uh, you know, as a child. He didn't know at the time how to deal with those feelings. He took care of everyone else, but when he put the light on himself, he had a hard time taking care of himself. That time in his life, I think he was getting towards that place. He was starting to work on himself with therapy and taking care of himself, where he was realizing there's a lot more to life and there's a lot more to figure out. Do you watch dad's movies? Oh, yeah, I do at least. Yeah. Yeah, we, I, I do, you know, put on his movies every once in a while and, and check them out for sure. And it's so healthy to laugh, right? Well, There's yeah. nothing yeah. better, nothing that heals you more than watching something make you laugh. And that entire time during the interview, I laughed. 
Yeah. yeah. I could not conduct an interview because I was <laughs> laughing, and that's the memory that stays with me, and that's why that interview has to be my all-time favorite. Oh. I love it. Chris and Jennifer are just as warm and funny as their father. They are certainly John Candy's greatest legacy. Now, a great conversation always starts with a measure of curiosity, a desire to know something more about a person, what makes them tick. So I am truly grateful to all of those I've met in the last 50 years, and there are a lot of them who have satisfied my curiosity. It's been my pleasure and privilege, and the conversations, well, they're not over yet. I'm looking forward to the next one. And Sandy, well, she keeps on going. Recently, she launched a new 5.30 national newscast on CTV. We'll be right back with the last word. Space, the final frontier. William Shatner has traveled across a fictional universe and he's found himself in and out of a number of television roles and interview chairs. In 2012, he told W5 reporter Tom Walters what drives him to keep exploring and to continue to go where no one has gone before. I desperately need the love of others, and I desperately search for approval by doing this interview. By doing your work is, is, is acting a search for approval in terms Absolutely. of... Absolutely. When that audience stands up and applauds me, stands up and applauds me, and not just, I oh, wasn't that nice, but they come up with a roar, because it's nothing that they expected. I move to tears every night. You can watch that entire documentary, as well as all of our news stories, on W5's official YouTube channel. I'm Avery Haynes, on behalf of everyone here at W5. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. I've worked at CTV for almost 50 years. That's why we're Five here. 5-0? Oh? Five zero. My God, so I mean, look at you. You're wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Wow. OK, now I have to change my opinion of you all these years. No, you don't have to change a word. I'm still cantankerous. How did you start? My first job, yeah. mean walking in the door out of university. And I talked my way into a job answering the phone. What was the job, answering the phone? For the director of news, yeah. CTV National News. Did you do news. a good job? Well, he had to promote me to get me out of his hair. See, <laughs> right? I wasn't that's what I mean. That, you but... probably brought out the cantankerousness <laughs> in him. <laughs> when I'm 92, I want to have the same energy that you have. And we didn't put 92 candles What on. is it? Here you go, you can choose to have it or not. Layered but... chocolate cake. Would it be wonderful fun if I took off all this and I pushed it in? in I was waiting okay, for this. No. I, I knew it. I knew it was going to happen. <laughs> You're not going to do it, no, though, I'm are not you? Do it. <laughs> <laughs> and do you know what you said at the end of the interview when you went up to see me? I've upset your little girl. So here you are. What That's what you said. I've upset you again. <laughs> We've got to meet every 50 years. It'll be wonderful. <laughs>